Okay. Do I have to push this? All already on? The only thing you have to push is to make sure your mic is red so that it's on. They'll handle the timing. It's red. Okay. okay. You're good. Great. Um, so, so let's start by um, all agreeing that this word that you see up here, de-identification, is a horrible, horrible term. It's five syllables. That's seven syllables, right? De-identified is five syllables. This is one of the most difficult challenges that you have talking about this topic. Um, so I'm calling this little introduction to de-identification, its relationship to clinical trials. Uh, oh, the possibilities, because there are possibilities. Um, first, a couple of disclosures up front. Uh, I, I have done several paid consultancies uh, for Sanofi and as well as Celgen uh, for de-identification of the data that they have shared or will be sharing out into the public. Um, and then from uh, 2009 to 2013, I was a paid consultant to the Office for Civil Rights, uh, helping them put out the identification guidance a la HIPAA. Um, so I was, I was asked to also tell you what is de-identification to begin with. Um, so according to the EU, first of all, the word de-identified doesn't exist. That's one thing to recognize. Um, but they do talk about anonymization, and they say that the principles of protection shall no longer apply or shall not apply to data rendered anonymous in such a way that the data subjects are no longer identifiable. When you translate that into the privacy rule under HIPAA, uh, it says that information does not identify an individual, and there's no reasonable basis that the information could be used to identify an individual. And then under the privacy rule, or at least under this definition, there are two things that are specified, two potential routes that are specified, and um, it, it irks me a little bit when I hear people talk about safe harbor so much, because what safe harbor says, it's basically this little thing that says remove 18 things and you're good to go. Um, they also, but people tend to forget that there's this other thing that says you have to have no actual knowledge that the residual information can be used to identify an individual. If you don't do that, it's not safe harbor. The other one is this funky thing, which is expert determination. Uh, and in this situation, people apply statistical or scientific principles to show that the data is no longer identifiable, or that there's a very small risk that somebody who is an anticipated recipient could identify an individual. And, and so we, we have to be really careful about the terminology here. Um, everybody tends to talk about safe harbor. They tend not to talk about this expert determination a lot. Um, so the safe harbor. This, this, 18, this list of 18 is an artifact, actually, of the definition of a limited data set under HIPAA. Uh, so a limited data set basically specifies a bunch of things that are, are taboo, like the names of patients but not providers, uh, unique numbers like social security numbers, medical record numbers, phone numbers, anything that has to do with the internet, biometrics. Now, DNA has not been designated a biometric underneath HIPAA. There's a lot of reasons for why that's the case, and we can discuss that if need be. Um, so Safe Harbor was basically an extension of this that said you drop dates, you can't have anything that's less specific than a year, all elderly individuals, they get top coded into 89 and above, you can't have specific geographic regions, there's this arbitrary cutoff of t at least 20,000 people in a particular place. And then there's this catch-all that says any other unique identifying number, characteristic, or code. Okay, so that's your definition of Safe Harbor. Um, that's not my definition of, of the identification that I tend to use in practice. I tend to go more towards expert determination, which is that it's a proportionality measure. Uh, we look at a couple of things. We look at uniqueness. You must be able to distinguish people in the population and separate them from others. You must be able to have the data as a replicable entity. In other words, it must be reproducible. It can't just exist in your one database and never exist anywhere else, because if that's the case, I can't use it to identify somebody. And it has to be available. So there must be people who have access to the resources that you're concerned about. If that's not the case, then the chances of somebody committing a re-identification is pretty slim. It might not be zero, but it's pretty slim. So here's an example. So a drug dose may be unique, right? You may have a particular number specifying what your dose was, and you might have been the only person that received that, but it's not necessarily accessible to the public in any way. Nobody's going to know that information except for you and possibly the clinician that administered that drug dosing. Um, the other thing to recognize in this world is that adversaries tend to have incomplete knowledge. They don't look at an entire data set, look at what happens to somebody over time, 
at every single time they went into a hospital and are able to track them at every single time and observe who they are. So we tend to model adversaries as having partial knowledge. Uh, so here's an example of something that would look like a statistically de-identified data set. Um, I don't have enough time to go through everything, but I wanted to give you a little bit of taste of what these types of data could look like. Um, so, so where this came from was that this was a, a particular data set that was generated through an oncology clinical trial for data that will be deposited at Project Datasphere, which hasn't been talked a lot about uh, since, uh, since I've been here. Um, I'm not going to go through Datasphere. I know that Charles Hugh Jones has talked about this at a previous IOM workshop, but I will encourage you to take a look at their principles. Um, so th these are decisions that were backed out of statistical analyses. I've translated them into words so that it makes it easier to understand. Um, one of the first things that we did was we took out the free text. It's very difficult to tell what shows up in natural language, so it's only field structured data. Um, we removed the contact information of individuals, just like you would, you know, you would want to. These are direct identifiers. We course in geographic areas, though. Um, so there are five different regions around the world from which these participants may have come. The age was reported at the year, but it was top coded at 85. Uh, the dates of the trial related events were actually permitted to go out in this data set, but death related events were limited to one week intervals. Um, the proof of the protection that was done on this, it was a statistical analysis associated with population statistics as well as some sampling versus population statistics. Um, and basically what we did was we looked at the identifiability of individuals under a safe harbor model, said here's our threshold, and then we would look at the combination of these factors and we'd say was the identifiability no worse. All right. So under the safe harbor model, there was a certain fraction of the U.S. population that would have been identifiable, and then what we showed was that in this data set, it was much lower. Okay. Um, this was with respect to the U.S., um, but this was not necessarily how things would play out in other countries. So what we did was we extrapolated the analysis to simulate the diversity of various demographic distributions. And so this is just an example. Um, actually, this is the analysis for this data, um, but it's justification. Uh, so we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at Safe Harbor. Uh, we looked at what the U.S. looks like, and then we looked at places that were more moderately diverse, uh, moderately less diverse, and then significantly less diverse because European populations tend to be extremely white. Um, it's just a little bit more diverse, less diverse. So um, you can see that this is the population size in terms of how big of a group are we looking at on the X, and then the percent identifiable in that uh, group. Um, and that, that's in moderately more than the U.S. That's the U.S. That's what moderately less than the U.S. looks like. That's significantly less, and that's where Safe Harbor came in. And so based on that analysis, that's where we ended up coming up with a, a little cutoff that said you can't have a region that has less than 10 million people in it in this group. Okay, so that said, uh, de-identification is not a panacea. Um, there is always a risk of re-identification, no matter how you define it. Uh, risk, however, it exists in any security setting. Just ask Edward Snowden. And then the challenges here are that uh, you need to determine what an appropriate level of risk is. We've done this in information security settings. There are principles for this. I would encourage you to look at them. Um, the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technologies has issued their own guidance on this. Uh, you also have to be able to ensure accountability in this setting. So I still strongly agree, believe that data use agreements are important to use, regardless of if it's de-identified. You still want to know that if somebody does something weird with this data set, you can hold them accountable. HIPAA does not let you do that currently. Um, and as I mentioned, risk should be proportional to the anticipated recipient. Um, I, I strongly believe that there's a very big difference in taking a data set, putting it out into the public realm, versus giving it to a vetted investigator. These are two completely different settings. Um, last slide. Um, we do know that de-identification, at least historically, notwithstanding genetic or proteomic data, can be safe. Um, we did a study on this a couple years ago. Uh, Colette el and I uh, looked at uh, actual re-identification attempts on data sets. Uh, we looked at all attacks through 2010. There had been 14 published re-identification attacks of any type. Um, Eleven of them were actually conducted by researchers who were doing demonstration attacks, just to show that it's possible. Um, and only two of these attacks actually looked at data that followed any type of a standard, okay? Like, 
safe harbor or a statistical model under HIPAA. And in the case of safe harbor, for instance, this was from a demonstration study that was done by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. It was shown that the risk of identification was really small. You could read the number, but it was really small. Okay, um, okay, wrap it up. Uh, what you have to consider, there is no definitive standard for a risk assessment in this field. That's a problem. Uh, there is no agreed upon identification methodology. OCR put out guidance on this back in November of 2012. They did not want to issue policy, but they did provide a list of various strategies that have been deemed to be useful. Um, there is less guidance in the EU than in the US or Canada. And, and in many ways, what goes on in the EU and goes on in Australia in terms of how de-identification works, they look at what we do. And then they issue their guidance based on what we do. Um, there is the ICO report from the UK. There's the Information Commissioner Office's report on the Code of Practices for anonymization that came out last year. You might want to look at that. Um, but the most important thing for us is that there have to be case studies. There have to be illustrations of what the data has been useful for and what are the types of utility functions that we need to take into account to figure out what's the appropriate way to de-identify data. Otherwise, we're just de-identifying in the dark. We might remove the wrong thing. So that's it.